Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, drummer for rock band Styx and award-winning educator Todd Zuckerman. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another episode of the Rich Redmond Show. And as always, we have so we ha- we have the best personalities on this show. We're talking thought leaders, comedians, actors, musicians, and even drummers. A lot of drummers, as always. Today we're coming from two cities. My co-host, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy Voiceovers.com from Spring Hill, Tennessee. What's up, Jim? How you doing? Good, I'm doing great. How was your weekend? It was uh, busy. Yeah, soccer and baseball. <laughs> you're always busy, or you're camping. Yeah. Um, you know, I always say I'm excited about today's guest, but this is this is royalty. This is is a friend of mine, long overdue. But he's one of the most celebrated touring and recording drummers on the planet, and nearly 25 years with the iconic rock band Styx. My friend Todd Zuckerman, how are you, buddy? I'm doing great, Rich. How you doing, man? Good to see you, Austin, Texas, right? Correct. Just outside Austin, Texas in the hill country, but 30 minutes west. And you're right up the street from our mutual friend, Eric Doris, yeah? Yes, he's, he's, up, he's up the hill from me. Up the hill. It is hill country. Yeah. Yes, it is. And that are, is you, that- are you perhaps in proximity of the Wizard Academy? I don't know what that is. <laughs> okay. It's in Austin. The There's Wiz. A, the, the Wizard, the wizard uh, yeah, I think it's called the Wizard Academy. Yeah. Uh, very Jim, complex. Look at all the snare drums. I mean, if you had a snare drum fetish and then there's all the kits in the corner. I mean, I've seen this setup of yours. This is if you guys are just consuming with your ear holes. Todd is coming from his, his tracking studio in the hill country of Austin, Texas. And there's just kits and there's shining gold and drums and mics. It's like a, a playground. It very much is a playground here. here. Actually, I can maybe uh, pick up and then kind of get for the viewers spin around. And you got like a headless kit there? Is it like a Phil Collins type vibe? That, that is a 1978 premiere uh, concert time kit, six through, uh, six through 16. So octopus style. Wow. It's a little jazz 18 uh, inch bass from Slingerland, and that's the main uh, recording rig, the, the Pearl Masterworks back there. Oh, the one we see in the videos all the time. And that's, that's the Sonar Forest over there. And actually, over here, we got the, uh, the Pearl Forest over there. Wow. Like that. That's kind of an interesting thing that you and I have in common. We were talking about the last time we saw each other, which was April of 2017, which is hard to believe, but you did a clinic at Forks Drum Closet here in Nashville, and it was like standing room only. It was like there was no room to stand. It was like a line out the door, and I was out the door kind of peeking in, and it was incredible, and then all of us guys kind of in the scene, we all went out afterwards for cocktails. It was a great time. I can't believe three years. I, I know, and you know what? I, I think I remember that night particularly – well, for a few reasons, uh, not the least of which was uh, the cocktails we had late night. <laughs> but what, when I when I arrived, and I, I mean this is no disparaging way towards what was going on with the, <clears throat> the Forks Drum Shop, but um, I noticed that none of my Nashville friends had had reached out and said, "Hey, I see you're coming next week." It had been like crickets, and so when uh, I was picked up by John Farquharson. Uh, um, it, it, in Nashville, I said, "Hey, uh, how how are we doing at this clinic?" And there's kind of this silent pause. He said, "Well, we have 24 hours to kind of promote this thing because it kind of hasn't been promoted." <laughs> and, I th- and I thought, "Gee, you know, I'm with Pearl Drums right here in Nashville. I can't stiff." Um, and it was at uh, what? Do you remember the name of the, the rehearsal place? That rehearsal. Oh, is it the oh, the big sound. room at Sound Check? Okay, right, right, right. So you know, I I didn't want to stiff. So uh, you know, guys like you and and, and Jim Riley and, and people got on the horn and like you know the Facebook uh, dr- uh, Nashville Drummers Group, and there was literally a line out the door, and even people from Pearl gave up their human space. They they never heard a damn note because they gave up the space so others that, that that came could be there. So it was it went from absolute terror to a triumph within 24 hours so <laughs> that, was and that was a big turnout yeah big you turnout. could take all of my clinics that i've done in the last 15 years and put them together and that would be the people in that one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't say that oh my god it was it was it was really great though i mean look at this list of of uh folks that you've played with sticks spinal tap 
Brian Wilson, the list goes on and on, but just right there, that's enough to kind of hang no, your hips hey, on. I'm, I'm, I'm wearing my Brian Wilson uh, hoodie here. Look at that. Nice. Now, when did that happen? Was that like during sticks or was it pre sticks? Yeah, it happened. Uh, it happened during sticks. Uh, there was a producer I did a lot of work with when I lived in Chicago named Joe Thomas, who was producing Brian's imagination record and then was going to do, he was the MD on uh, Brian's first ever solo tour that he was planning after the record. And um, Eddie Bears actually had done most of the record and Joe called me in to play a couple tracks. And then uh, he was really excited about what I did and said, hey, would you be interested in doing the tour? And I said, well, yeah, as long as it doesn't conflict with, with Styx, because at that time Styx wasn't sort of a, a, a 12 month uh, through the calendar type thing. It was, you know, the summertime, you know, May through September. So yeah. that was sort of the genesis of how I, I got in with the organization. And I, th I think I'm on uh, maybe five records, uh, five of Brian's records. Um, but I, I did his first tour in, in 99, uh, had recommended uh, a female singer named Taylor Mills because they were looking for a female singer in Chicago. And uh, we sort of fell in love in the rehearsals for the tour, and uh, she, the woman I ended up marrying. Um, so very happy ending there. And, um, and then Sticks picked up again. Um, and I, I never, you know, returned to the touring thing, but, but I, I did play a bunch of Brian's records, which is always so much fun. I and mean, that's amazing. Yeah. Two words. Pet sounds. <laughs> love and mercy. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen that movie? Uh, yes, I did. Is that a pretty accurate portrayal of what happened? You know, I wasn't around for, <laughs> you know, all those things that happened, actually going back to the 60s, but uh, there was nothing that I didn't previously hear about. You know, there's nothing, you know, my wife and I went to see that movie, and, um, you know, we thought, we thought that, uh, um, you know, who the two the two actors, Paul... Um, Paul Giamatti and yeah. John Cusack. Well, no, Cusack, but Cusack played yeah. Latter Day Brian, and then mm -hmm. uh, uh, Paul. Um, early played, Brian was. was early uh, Brian. Anyway, they, they were both great, and I yeah. know a lot of people had issues with divorcing themselves from seeing that that's John Cusack, but mm -hmm. Cusack really nailed so many of Brian's mannerisms and just the way he kind of stood or turned around. Like Taylor and I were kind of holding each other's hand and like we'd, you know, we'd squeeze you know, each other's hand or, or, or uh, our leg because he would just do a simple thing that was so friggin' Brian. Um, he really nailed it. So yeah, we, we enjoyed the movie. I, we weren't sure what we were gonna be walking into, but we walked out of there going, that was really lovingly done. Wow. Yeah. I mean, 99 was a big year. Um, you guys have been together. That would make 21 years together. Mm -hmm. um, that same year, I met a young singer-songwriter named Jason Aldean. That changed my life. Our, bar, our lives were both changed forever. Um, wow. And so, that, you know, you're, you're a road dog. I mean, at least 100 shows a year or averaging 100 shows a year for the last 24 years. Keeping a marriage together, I wasn't able to pull it off, man. Congratulations. Well, thanks. I mean, you know, look. No, nothing is easy in life. Everything is a balance. And, you know, with, with something like that also comes uh, with the group that I was in. I mean, I, I, I entered a, a band where these guys, they had already done the crazy partying and the throwing TV sets out the window. And <laughs> they got that stuff out of the way when they were young. So they were older and married and, and kept their marriages together. So that led by example. I mean, when I was 26 and got in the band yeah. if i got in an organization that you know wanted to get friggin crazy every night i go well gee this looks like fun you know it'd be a <laughs> bit, of a, bit of a joiner inner but seeing how they conducted themselves and how they kept their marriages together that sort of led by example and i thought that's really the way to do it mm -hmm. um so I, I i i feel i was fortunate that again they they led by example and you know if, if there was uh, a craziness on the road, it would be very odd in within that group. Nice. So that's that's what um, what that I call Coco Jammies. It's like a, in a in a group like that, you can very well end up having your Cocoa Puffs in your jammies like thirty minutes after the show. Oh, not quite. <laughs> not, we're, we're not boring. Potential for that. None of us are boring. No, I mean you know, look, I've been known to enjoy a cocktail or two, and and uh, you know, the couple of guys as well. So uh, it's just. It's, it's more good, clean fun. Yeah. And, you know, at a certain point you go, I, I love my wife and I don't want, like, to have half my stuff. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, he all those snare drums. It goes beyond that, but I mean, of you know, when when you see what divorce has done uh, uh, to people, you know, I go, God, there, there, but for the grace of God, go I. So yes, it's, no. it's very simple. Yeah, man. Well, congratulations on a, on a job like in the music business. Uh, 24, 25 years with one artist is like your point zero 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 one percent of the people that are in this game. It's just such a rare thing, especially in your organization you, with people you love and enjoy and you're traveling the world together. Um, incredible. And I know you've recorded with so many people, but I, I would be... I really want to shed some light on this new project of yours. Ten new songs, Last Flight Home. You're releasing it or have released it on CD. You can get the audio files and you can get vinyl. And this is you essentially fronting like Dave Grohl. You're singing all the songs. Yeah, to, to really kind of give you the Reader's Digest, uh, the old buddy of mine, J.K. Harrison, that I used to work with in the old days, he'd been kind of cajoling me and pestering me to do a record with him for a number of years and he believed in me when I didn't and I always looked at him like dude it's cute that you think that I could do that but thanks but no thanks <laughs> and there was just a, a confluence of events where I was going to be in Los Angeles and I had a couple afternoons off and a couple evenings off and um, you know he just hit me up at, 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 a, at the right time and I thought what the hell let's get together and see what happens at the very least I know we're going to have a couple cocktails and a bunch of laughs and you know no harm no foul yeah so it was really, I want to say it was the second night um, we wrote the song Last Flight Home in like 20, 30 minutes and just a lightning round, round back and forth. And it was one of those, you know, you wish it was always that easy all the time, you know? Yeah, right. Like, yeah. gee, songwriting's fun, you know, when it comes together like that and it just the, the yellow brick road materializes in front of you. Um, and that's sort of what happened. And then it dawned on me, I thought, holy smokes, like, I, I could I could sense this was happening. I could see this proverbial yellow brick road materialize, and um, he he just he totally believed in me and encouraged me. And such a great producer, and we we've known each other for so long that I could proverbially proverb, proverbially stand naked in front of him and 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 just totally be terrible. And then have him coach me. This is what you need to do. And I mean, I, you know, I sing background in sticks. I mean, I, it's it's I've I've sang before. I've sung before. I have I have done sung. Um, You've done some singing. I've sang. I've done some singing and some mighty fine picking and agreeing. I mean, those tuners would be on fire for me, buddy. If I was singing lead vocals, <laughs> they'd be smoking. <laughs> but it, you know, it was something that I always thought you'd be. It'd be great to to have the ability to do that, like, like to throw a 60 yard, you know, uh, uh, a pass or, you know, hit a home run or be an astronaut or whatever. I, but I, I didn't feel that I really had the tools to do it, but, but JK believed in me and, and he really coaxed it out of me and, you know, living with a, a, a brilliant singer also helps, uh, as well. Um, although I was terrified to play her stuff for a little while because one, one word from her could have just, been a gash the tires you know <laughs> i never would have recovered oh. uh, you know just, oh, oh. well everyone check that out man it's the last flight home and it's and Thanks. i love the cover it's like uh it's like uh maybe like 12 or 16 uh hotel doors with your suitcase and it's like a nice little pastiche yes and, and there's pastiche. music videos that our, our friend eric doris did a couple of those for you and you're mm -hmm. like in a top hat and they're all conceptual and you got lyric <laughs> videos i mean you went to town this could be a thing when covid goes away you might have a whole other revenue stream where you're fronting your own band well look i have no misgivings about you know wanting to be a uh, uh, a singing celebrity of, of any stretch it was really a grand experiment to see if i could actually do this and Dude, truth be told, like my mom didn't even know I was doing this record until yeah. it was done uh, because I wasn't convinced that I was actually going to cross the finish line, that I was actually going to do it. And, you know, it, we, we mixed and mastered it and ordered the manufacturing in early February. And then what hit? COVID. My yeah. initial thought was, well, my goodness, I can't release this in the middle of a global pandemic and economic uncertainty and then you know here i am on facebook like hey buy my record but you know, people are, are, are losing their jobs they're dying or you know it was horrible yeah but i had enough uh musicians say to me in, in a close confidence you know that you have this record it's done you literally have them in your office 
why not release it? Maybe now is the, is the time. Maybe now people need entertainment, or sure. maybe now they will actually sit and listen to 40 minutes of a, of a whole record top down instead of just one song on a playlist or whatever. So I, I, I posed that question to, you know, uh, on my socials, and it was 99%, yeah, re release it now. So I actually moved up the release date from the end of end of May to May 2nd, which is my birthday, because who, who gives a shit about your 51st birthday, right? After the <laughs> so I gave myself a little reason to be excited about 51, and... Um, that, that's that's how it came to be. Well, what, what did you do for your 50? I, I was, I mean, I had my 50th during COVID. So my girlfriend took me out to Joshua Tree and I played my little Dharma drum and looked at the stars for a weekend. It was fun, but we were just the two of us. I wanted yeah. to have a big bash with like, you know, you know, strippers and fire trucks and, and smidgets. And <laughs> well, you can still do that. <laughs> yeah. That's, that, was, that was last Tuesday over here. Yeah. Um, now, for, for 50, uh, I was just uh, with my wife and daughter. So that was nice. It was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, doing it that way. Although I didn't realize 51 was going to be the same circumstances. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not one for big bashes because I really don't like having to clean things up. Although I, I have had a couple parties over here during PASIC when it's been in Austin that have been somewhat legendary, if I may say so myself, but, uh, <laughs> but not, not feeling very well the next day having to clean up, you know, it's like having Leonard Skinner in 1976 and, the, and, and a tour party in your house. <laughs> <laughs> Poolside, man. Well, so how did this all start for you? You're a Chicago kid, right? And exactly. your dad was a drummer, and your mom was an actress, and you had a musical family. So this was – tell us a little bit about that. Well, my, my father, he put himself through medical school playing the drums. That's awesome. And wow. he was one of the house drummers at the Chez Paris for 18 years in Chicago, which was like the Cotton Club of Chicago. So he played – Liberace to Sammy Davis Jr. to Joey Lewis, Lena Horn, um, Sophie Tucker. Uh, and he met my mother. He, he was 20 years uh, her senior. Go, Dad. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and she was a, a singer, actress, and could play the piano. And I was the youngest of uh, three boys. Uh, and my, my older brother, Paul, immediately took to the piano when he was a little kid. Uh, as did my brother Joel, but when I came along, I was in love with the drums from the get-go, and it was sort of clear that that's what I was going to do, so Joel ended up playing bass, and we grew up together as a rhythm section, you know, piano-based drums. Um, so, you know, we would go for a swim or go throw a ball around and then go in and, and, and play for a, a bit, and that's, uh, that's how we grew up, and it was, it was really the greatest card I was dealt with it was such a head start and there was you know a stereo in every room so you know uh. count basie could be coming out of one room and blood zeppelin could be coming out of another room or mozart or whatever and it was just music um and because my older brothers were were good they always had friends that were older that were musicians right. so they'd come home with all these records and hey what's that boom so you know i'm, I'm, I'm getting hip to you know uh uh Return of Forever, Romantic Warrior, and stuff like that. When I'm eight, um, yeah, that was a jump start. It was it was it was a great, amazing way to grow up. And I used to go to friends' houses and look around and go, "Where the hell are your instruments? <laughs> How do you live like this? How do you live like this? What the hell's the matter with you? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you people? <laughs> well, you know what you know what tells me why I was going to say, Jim. You know why I could know that Todd was great and destined for greatness is you went to Berkeley. For not even one year, and then you—the it seemed like the real world was calling you. It was like there's so many people go to Berkeley. <laughs> the ones that like really make it, they're like, yeah, this was nice, and yeah. uh, I'm gonna go I'm live done. my life. And yeah, the, no, it was more like the real world made me run out of money. It was more like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I definitely would have gone back a, a, a second year, but like, you know, like my parents had split, and there was financial uh, hardships and whatnot. And, I, and I, so when I went, I knew I knew it was going to be one year. So I really, I had a good time, but I also made the most out of it because I knew that it was going to be one year. And I sought out Gary Chafee and I just, I lucked into being able to study with him because he had a six month to a year waiting list at that time. Wow. And I just happened to call him as the guy canceled and I convinced him. I said, look, I'm only here another six months. It's really important to me. And he said, well, can you be here every Wednesday at three? I said, yes. 
without knowing where I'm going to get the money or how, where the hell I, I'm going to do that. And I had a class that I just stopped going to because, look, give me an F, see if I care. You know, yeah. <laughs> if I never show up again, <laughs> I'm going to go do that. Uh, so that's really how, how it went. But I didn't realize that there was kind of a secret little um, one year at, at Berkeley Club that whenever someone go, you went one year, there was kind of like a little nod and, and, and a wink. And yeah. actually, and not, not to name drop, but, but Vinnie Cagliuta reached over a, a, a dinner table and gave me a big high five when he, when he heard that I only went for one year. He said, yeah, me too. Bam. Bam. <laughs> And Steve, so and and Steve was there too, right? Steve, Steve, Steve went there. I want to say three, three and a half years, and he got the Jean Luc Ponty gig, mm, and right. you know, just up and split. Wow! <laughs> yeah. They should make a documentary with all you guys going back and finishing up your uh, education. Thing. I can't afford to go back. <laughs> <laughs> well, we talk about that. Have, all. You, have you seen how much it costs to go there now? What's the What's the price now? I think it's like oh, sixty it's grand a year, right? I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's about 80. So oh four times gosh. 320 grand. Ouch. For something you can learn on YouTube. Well, this, I mean, <laughs> if you go to law school, you're going to come out a lawyer, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, you graduate <laughs> with 320 grand worth of debt and you're playing the pizza parlor for 50 bucks. The math's That's off. Right. And, and you, it's a, and it's you a good business plan. You can't even play the pizza parlor now because there's no music. There's no music. Yeah. Everything has been impacted. Like every everything that I do for my bread and butter requires me to share a stage or be in the room with other people. It's so crazy. Yes, it is, <laughs> isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> I remember you telling me about the airline mileage game. You're like, oh, get into that. Oh, yeah. You love it. And then you're just like, bring me stuff. Bring me <laughs> <No>. first class. <laughs> Bring me, <laughs> bring me stuff. I need um, Sunday. I need a Sunday. <laughs> I need a hot rag. Yeah. Well, boy. Uh, yeah. It, it's crazy that you know I haven't stepped on a plane since then. Uh, you know the the whole the whole airline airport thing. I, I always looked at it like I'm a character in a video game. Handling everything, hand, hand delays, everything that comes with what we do when when you're on a hundred hundred and twenty flights a year. Um, knowing where your favorite places to eat are in different restaurants or where's the cool bathroom or this has got a cool, you know, at, where's the Admiral's Club? Do I have time? Oh, they moved it to, you know, uh, whatever, the sea concourse. Like this whole thing was always a constant video game that I, I would, you know, m maneuver and navigate. Uh, it's not a fun video game. <laughs> no, but it's, 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 uh, it's, I tried to make it fun. Yeah, <laughs> well, I guess that's one way to look at it. You just make yeah. it fun. So uh, after Berkeley, was that your Chicago period where you were doing the thousand radio and TV spots, doing all those jingles? And back when that was actually live people creating jingles. And now if there's if now if there's a jingle, it's like one guy with a laptop composer, right? Yeah, I mean that's really what killed the business. You know, the musicians are the, uh, the really the only people that, in their infinite wisdom, to undercut everyone else to the point where music's been devalued. I mean, there, back in those days, there were, you know, five and $10,000 budgets for a jingle house to put, you know, three, four, five, six, ten 10 musicians in a room wow. and come up with, with a bid for a spot. And it was great. And when, it, when a big campaign was up for grabs or, you know, let's say, um, let's say Budweiser was, the, the new campaign was up for grabs or McDonald's or something big. Every jingle house in the city and Chicago really was the Mecca for jingles. I and mean, of course there was work everywhere, but Chicago was yeah. really the, um, and so you'd work for like 14 different music houses or so. They're the ones that hired me anyway. There, there'd be like 30, but, uh, You'd, you know, you'd work for 14 different music houses and you go in and you do like five Budweiser spots for mm -hmm. this guy do five for another do five for another so you're getting paid and that's and union then, work right residuals yeah. oh my yeah. god well, well well but but these these are the demos and then you you just hope that whoever wins the shootout and wins the campaign was one of the jingle houses that you uh, you worked for that you yeah. played on because then invariably they'd want to change one thing so you go back and do it again and then when that flew then 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 you got the residuals so that was 
Those were fantastic. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to MusiciansMortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLS, ConsumerAccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. We've been having some internet problems there in Austin, Texas. No big deal. Um, Todd, we were talking about your methods and mechanics and how that was a game changer as far as like production quality and just the content that you were putting out there. It was like, it was intense. It was, there was a lot of value. It won all the awards. And then when, when I met Eric Doris through um, Victor Salazar, I was like, I'm, oh my God, this is the perfect guy to use because this looks like a feature film. Eric was definitely the man and our, our mutual friend Victor Salazar when, when he he heard that I was moving to Austin that's the first thing that he said he'd been cajoling and harassing me to do a video for quite some time and he said oh I worked with Eric Doris on the drum pads uh, at a 20th anniversary he said, he's the guy so um, I said okay okay I'll, I'll, I'll meet your pal and Eric and I met at a Mexican restaurant near the house and loved him and by the end of the deal or the, the meal, we had a deal with a handshake. Yeah. And um, he, he, uh, he, you've worked with him, so you know he's brilliant. And he has kind of this mellow, uh, like a mellow Matthew McConaughey type of thing about him <laughs> in a way. You know, where the house that we shot the first one in had all these big bay windows. <laughs> and there was, sometimes the light was harsh. And I kind of have that Chicago, you know, let's go, let's go. And he'd kind of walk over and, all right, Todd, uh, listen, um, light's, light's a little harsh right now, so Nathan's going to put the rub on the ribs, and uh, we're just going to wait for this to pass, and then, then we'll get going. And I'm like, yay! You know, I just had my coffee, and I'm like, ready to go. <laughs> so it was a different pace uh, of working with him, but his, his eye for detail is uh, unsurpassed. He's, he's the... Uh, Scorsese of, of, of drum videos. Of, of drum videos. He, he, he said, maybe I'm just, he's just going to do one more and then retire. And he's also done like amazing like live concerts like uh, Holdsworth. And I think um, <clears throat> Captain Kirk has, did a big thing. Like um, Kirk Covington did a big mm -hmm. thing with horn section and all that. And he did that. It's, it's so brilliant. And when I think about the sweat equity that he put into like, you know, my drumming in the modern world, it was like, 20 hours of editing per song. Like, now, did, wow. Did, did you sit with him for a lot of that editing time? I flew in two times to oversee things and we would drop box things back and forth to each other. And we would always kind of like take breaks and do a little tequila or go to the Mexican <laughs> food restaurant. He likes to, to, to cushion the hard work with fun, which is a great business for you know. Oh, yeah. But by methods and mechanics, too, we were starting out with Irish coffees at 10 o'clock in the morning, walking out to the studio to start the, start the <laughs> editing process. Um, yeah, the thing with, with, with Eric is his, his eye, his attention to detail, and you know how long it takes to render something, right? If yes. you have to redo something. And we'd be watching, and he'd say, does that chord bother you? And I'd say, what, what, what are you talking about? And then he'd point to the screen, and you'd see 
part of a micro- mi- microphone cord in the, the far bottom corner, just a sliver of it. <laughs> yeah, like I know what that's like. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and he'd be like, okay. And then I just knew it. He'd have to stop and he'd have to g- get rid of that and, and you know wait another 10 minutes just yeah. for that one shot that's five seconds long. It yeah. drove him crazy to even have that in there. So uh, yeah. it, it, it took a long time to, to edit things. It's just amazing to have a guy like that on your team. And then recently you did not, uh, something brilliant as well. You did rock drumming masterclass for Drumeo. People from 60 countries you've impacted with that thing. So cool. And then the other thing that I want to give you massive props for is that, you know, there's a bunch of us that are out, and I wouldn't say a bunch, but I'd say like you, me, Riley, Shulman, Stanton, Kenny, we're trying to keep the drum clinic alive, right? So we're going to these mom and pop stores. We're going to these big box stores. We're trying to bring the drums to the, so that kid who's never seen a live drum clinic can go like, wow, they can smell our musk and they can ask us questions, but it's been getting harder and harder to do because, you know, it's uh, music education is a tough sell. So you're like, okay, I'm not going to get the companies involved. We're just going to do a straight cash deal. Here's my thing. You put change the model, and then me and Jim Riley are doing that same thing right now. It's like, come into the store, sign up, cash, and you do the thing. Well, you know, for, from from my perspective, like you know, I drum clinics were very important to me when I was a kid. Absolutely. Up. And uh, I don't take myself seriously, but I, I take those seriously, and I love doing them. Uh, they also kind of got a bad rap for a while for guys that would just go like blow for a half hour and say any questions and then like, you know, split out on the autograph thing, whatever. Like, and that's, that's lame. Ouch. Um, you know, I, I, I will stay and shake every last hand and take every last picture. And, and, and what I started doing was, you know, in the old paradigm, you know, there'd be a big dinner with 13 people and, you know, in the old, old paradigm, you know, you'd go to Morton's and someone would have like a, some $3,000 dinner after the clinic. Well, those days are long gone. Long even, gone. <laughs> even, you know, finding a friggin' Applebee's or a, you know, Buffalo Wild Wing open on a Tuesday night in <laughs> Chillicothe, Ohio, or something like that. That's where it, my drum tech is from. <laughs> Chillicothe, Ohio. <laughs> Props to John that. Hall. Wow. Uh, y- y- you know, it, it's... Then you go there and then you have the reps and you get the store like who's picking up the the bill and so finally, you know, the last two years I said look, let's do this. I don't want anyone stressing out about well the kitchen at Applebee's closes at 10 so you got to get out of here when there's still a line at the autograph table. I'm going to take a picture with every last person. So I say look. Get a bottle of Hendrix gin, some fever tree tonic water, a case of beer, order in some pizzas. And we'll stay here. And when I'm done with everyone, we'll hang here at the shop. I'll have a couple pops, have some pizza. And when we're done, we're done. And that way, no one's stressing out. And I I know everyone is really appreciative of that. And look, there's no arrogance when I say this. Like back in the old days of of pre-COVID, I eat in the best restaurants restaurants in the world. I don't need to be taken out and babied and and stick it to someone by ordering, you know, a glass of cognac that costs $300 a shot. I don't need to do that. (laughs) So, but what I do need to do is I love having the interaction with people and having that experience and then having the, the, the drum shop go, that guy was cool as hell that this didn't cost, you know, five, six thousand dollars to, to do this event. We made some money. Everyone made some money. We had a good time. We had a couple of pops. We heard some stories. We shared some ideas and boom. It was yeah. a, I, I'd rather leave everyone with that lovely experience. And uh, I, I don't need to go to Morton's every yeah. But no, you flipped it on its head. And a lot of us have been kind of noticing like, well, let's just do it that way. Um, because there's a lot of uh, hosts that just don't, they just don't want to host. They're like, I got to call, I got to call five companies and organize all that. And then, so I noticed I was like, I'll take care of all that. That's white glove. But then they still don't want to do it. So you're just like, okay, no companies involved. Let's just do, let's just bring the music to the people. Well, dude, what, what, what I would do to convince them that this, the masterclass paradigm is going to work uh, was basically the thing I like about that is all education. Yep. And it's for you know, like 20 people that really want to learn. So they really want to be there. Yeah. There, there's, there's, there's no performance. There's no dog and pony show. There's no corporate sponsors that I have to spend time talking about. It's all about education. So uh, 
what I would do is I would say, look, here's, here's what it is. Here's your cut. This is my cut. You provide transportation and a hotel room. Flights are on me. And that, that way I could pick and choose my flights go, going through the airports that I like with the restaurants that I like, uh, add pad to my, the whole airline game. Uh, and it's, it's great. And I don't, you know, I don't mind paying $250 for a, a plane ride that's going to ultimately make me executive platinum and then get first class upgrades all the time for free. That's my pleasure. Uh, we got you figured out, buddy. Let's just talk to them. <laughs> and, now, and now everyone knows. Yeah. <laughs> so Jim was going to ask you about Spinal Tap. He's so curious about that. <laughs> Todd, what about Spinal Tap? <laughs> 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 what, a, what a way with words you have. Well, Jim, you've been so quiet. It's so unlike you. I, I okay. Well, <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to ask questions, but you know. There, there's one thing at the very top, if I can get this right. Do you see that thing right there? Yes. Oh, my God, the yes. And that you can't see. It's a white piece of paper. I, I come down, we're doing the, the Tonight Show. Boy, 20 years ago this month. Um, it's the first, first time I played with them. Um, and I come down, and it's okay, it's time to take your places. And I get behind the drums, and there's that piece of paper on the snare drum that says, set list. One, Stonehenge. Oh, my That's God. It. Where the and demons I'm like, dwell. I'm like, I'm keeping that, and I'm framing that. That's <laughs> awesome. That's what that is. Uh, yeah, so I got to play Stonehenge, complete with the little people and the 18-inch monument on, uh, uh, on Leno. I got to rewatch that movie. And uh, yeah, uh, those guys are they're pretty obviously. damn good musicians. Yeah, they really they play and they yeah. care. They care. It's yeah. not like oh, we're you know gazillionaire famous uh, 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 the TV and movie personalities, and this is just fun. They they're having fun. They're for real. They want to yeah. really play and seeing you know Christopher Guest kind of go through a couple martial heads. Like there's one that he didn't like you know, from SIR and let's try the other one. Like he really cares. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was, it's fun. And it, you know, it's, it's obvious that those guys are a firing My. squad of comedy. It's just hilarious being around them. And it was, uh, uh, you know, the few times I worked with them, it was just an absolute pleasure and a privilege. And they're all uh, delightful human beings. My wife and I are huge Christopher guest type movie fans. Uh, have you seen the uh, A Mighty Wind? Was that one? I've seen everyone multiple times. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, Best in Show is what I celebrate. That one is just wow. But I mean, from a musical standpoint. Well, CJ Vanston was my in. He's their musical director. And uh, uh, CJ was originally from uh, Michigan, but he was kind of ruling in the Chicago studio scene and moved to L.A., just as I sort of started getting in the scene there. Like uh, CJ moves to LA and the first big thing he does is he's the only musician on Richard Marks is right here waiting for you. And if mm. you remember, that was like a number one song for like oh 10 God. months. Yes. Uh, so he lands in Los Angeles and is like, uh, star instantly. So he, he did all the music to Christopher's movies and hmm. has been working with them since I want to say 91. One, 1990, 91 or so. Yeah. I, I have a special place in my heart for, um, uh, um, oh my God, the, 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 the first one with the, um, Cor Corky, Corky St. Clair. The, the, with the, uh, <laughs> yeah, Waiting for Guffman. <laughs> waiting for Guffman, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. and I, got, I got to tell Christopher, I said, you know, because my mom was in theater, and mm -hmm. I, I saw that at the Music Box Theater mm -hmm. in, in Chicago, as a little art movie theater, and, and I thought, oh my God, my mom would love this. And I said, thank you for giving me a reason to drive up to the suburbs and take my mom out on a date night and take her into the city to, to see a movie. And that's, I, I, we went to see Winfrey Guffman and right. I could tell he was kind of touched by that, that compliment, you know, that's Waiting awesome. for Guffman taught me that uh, Dairy Queen was referred to as DQ. Because oh yeah. We had DQs absolutely. all over Texas, man. I never heard it though. I never, we, we, the first time I saw Waiting for Guffman, I was in Bethel, Connecticut and I was 19 years old or whatever. But uh, do you know anything about how they film those movies? Do they actually, I've always heard that every scene is taken like, okay, here's your starting point. Here's the ending point. Just find a way to get there. 
Do you know anything about your enthusiasm? Yeah, I thought that's that's what I know. I mean, it's 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 largely improv. Here's an outline yeah. of what we're we're trying to do, and and let's just get get to that essence, however we do. And that's actually, cool. waiting for Guffman was filmed. I didn't know this uh, uh, in Lockhart, Texas, mm-hmm. which is I don't know, forty five minutes an hour outside of uh, of Austin. I miss Texas, man. I grew up in El Paso, then I went to Lubbock, then I went to Denton, then I went to Dallas. I mean, there's a there's great music scene in Texas, man. There really is, and the, the me, music education is credible. Well, with your mom being an actress, did, I saw a, a post recently. You were you were just loving on the Gary Shandling show, and you just rewatched the whole thing. Did you kind of get a taste for the dramatic arts from your mom? Uh, well, I suppose so. I mean, my, my parents were great admirers of, of the arts and anything of, of quality. So, yeah. um, and having older brothers, you know, I was watching Monty Python and stuff like that since I was six years old. So it's, you know what I mean? It, it's, I, I don't know how many six year olds would, would be checking that type of thing out. Um, yeah. but I, I've always loved you know, fine acting and <laughs> movies and television shows and yeah we just rewatched all the uh, the larry sanders shows which is my favorite show in the 90s yeah and it just it it blew me away even more now and we just we just finished up the finale the, the other night and it, it it hit me on a deeper emotional level because you know gary shandling's no longer with us rip torn um nor is normality and nor are my 20s when i watched that show and when every every night every sunday i think it was i couldn't wait for the new episode but it's just nothing had ever existed like that show before that and and Mm -hmm. even shows in movies you know from the west wing on to other comedies that ricky gervais created and whatnot they owe a huge debt of gratitude to the styles and techniques that that they really implemented there and and you know, I, I don't want to like put down other shows because I love a lot of other comedies, and even in the '90s. But it seemed to me that that was a Rolls Royce in a parking lot of bicycles back then. <laughs> you, you are, you're a massive influence on Facebook. I'm looking at both your your YouTube and the Facebook. Certainly outweighs the YouTube. I mean, the amount of counts that you have on these videos are sometimes, you know, hundreds of thousands of views. That's awesome. I got to tell you, one thing it's I was telling I, I, I just, it's just me just watching them over and over again. <laughs> it might be me too. You are a fun drummer to watch. I got to say that. Thank a, you, Jim. A lot of fun. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, just the, with the little feet, you know, you actually playing the stick songs that we all know and love. You can kind of hear them bleeding through the monitors when, you know, we, we hear what you're hearing and stuff like that. Um, I only ask you this, has this had like, you know, you were obviously a name coming up once you got the gig in the early, uh, you know, from 99 on, has that really added to like an explosion of, um, I guess, awareness and popularity for you with all the videos that are going on with Facebook for you? Like a lot more people reaching out and everything? Or? I mean, you know, I, I suppose social media in general has a, a wider reach, but as far as I'm concerned, I've just always done what I've done. And, yeah. you know, one, one, in one breath, someone will refer to me as a legend, which I always kind of feel weird Wince. about. And then, and then <laughs> uh, someone will say, I just discovered you. And I'm like, well, welcome. You, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's, I, I've been doing this, you know, uh, for a long, long time. And if, mm-hmm. if someone discovers me now, that's, that's fantastic. But the reason I started posting, some of the live sticks things wasn't for uh, likes or glorification. I started recording the shows because uh, I watched them the next day and I combed through them and I, I want to play that night better than I did last night. So if mm-hmm. I, I'll, I'll watch something, I go that that doesn't work or that feels uh, on top and hurry or that feels um, sluggish. I'll make those mental adjustments and then that next night play it and I'll remember my mental notes and then watch it again. That's the best way to get better. It's laborious. There's other things I'd rather be doing in my afternoons than reliving last night's show, but it always has to be last night's show. I don't give a damn about five shows ago. It doesn't matter because I can remember what I was thinking and feeling the night before. I'm rich. I'm sure you're where you guys are maybe the same when you play, but, um, but I, I, I will I will do that night to night. And if I could find 58 seconds 
of drumming that doesn't make me want to put a bullet in my head, I would I'll, <laughs> I'll post that. Yeah. And then yeah. pe- pe- people seem to like that. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, if I, if I find a, a spot that I kind of go, ah, that's what I wanted to do, and I actually did it, th- those are the, the things I post. I think yeah. you should start a new playlist on YouTube, drum parts that I've played that make me want to put a bullet in my head. That would be <laughs> there's, fun there's to There's plenty. Series. Uh, well, that's a, put, put a montage video together. My gosh, that would be amazing to watch. Well, like what we, we, what you consider to be awful, all of us are just sitting there salivating. You yeah, know what I, I mean? Did, I did. I had two montages of uh, absolute uh, gaffs and stick drops and, you know, stick fl- flying out. I, I, cause I, I'm amused by that. And there was, there was yeah. one that really sucked. I, I, I did something where I put the stick in my mouth. Well, actually, I got a stick here. That's what I'm going and I did something like on the clutch of the hi hat, and I mm-hmm. came down with the snare drum, and I whacked this out of my teeth, and it was like seeing stars. You know, I thought oh. I, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if I saw teeth come out uh, uh, with it. When and, when did you start just like, well, hey, I should put some of these you know songs up on the internet? Because uh, you watched the entire show, is that right? Oh. Yeah, it, he. Like, every it, time it, I have a good question, I know Jim. I yeah. load it up and it's like frozen. Frozen. Yeah, See, but I mean that's the kind of stuff. Yes, that's this is good gold nugget right here. You got it. Yes, oh, he's there, back. back. Huh. Yeah. I love so, it. So, well, at I mean, what point did you wait, wait a minute? He had uh, what time? There's no it? better way for someone, including yourself, to see and hear how you are executing your performance than sticking a camera. Three feet behind your behind you. That's why I started doing it in the early days, and I've been through so many iterations of. Yeah, but did you watch technology. your shows? Yeah, we watch them. Sure, I mean, you're like mm, the whole too show. Many, too many dodge gut booms, or too many uh, that that sounds sluggish, or I shouldn't have, I shouldn't be going to the bell there. They don't like the bell there. Yeah, you learn from it because you know I'm playing the same 24 songs year after year. I'm sure you feel the same way. You from time to time you'll change things, but the people want to hear the hits. Yeah. Of course. I mean, it, we kind of come cutting in and out again. That's all right. It's fun. You're there. You're rocking. Yeah. There you go. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's, it's all right. It's a windy day. The internet cables are made out of paper airplanes here. <laughs> <laughs> They're swaying on the poles. The uh, So going through all those all those videos, you watched every single show. Not just select pieces, right? You would actually watch two-hour shows. If, if the afternoon allowed me to do that, yes. Right. At um, what point did you decide to start taking them and putting them online just for, you know, what kind of compelled you to do that? Um, I, I, I don't know. I thought that maybe there was something in there that uh, pleased me. And in and, and, and the days where drummers and musicians were putting themselves on their own platforms, I thought, well... What the hell? Yeah. yeah. Let's see, see, see what happens. And, <laughs> and people seem to like it and we're requesting more. I'd say so. And, uh, you know, the, the reason why uh, the band is so soft in the mixes, it's a dedicated line from the monitor board into the camera. Mm. Yeah. But it's kind of so, cool to hear it that way because it sounds like you're hearing behind the scenes. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't know what – is going through anyone else's mind for their performance. So the next day, if I were to post something that maybe maybe Tommy Shaw thought, couldn't you hear? I was having a hard time on that song last night. Mm. And I don't, don't want to post something that someone else might have an issue with. Right. So if you know the songs, you know the songs. Or you, you can hear enough. But if, you know, if there's any warts on anyone's performance, you really can't detect that. Um, out of deference and uh, you know admiration for for them, so mm-hmm. um, you know I, w- I would hope uh, someone would do the same to me if you know if I had a particularly hard night and someone decided to post the whole show. Yeah, you know what I mean. So uh, I'm just trying to be kind to my bandmates. Yes, and in 2017, you guys did the mission, and you did that at Blackbird, right? Mm-hmm. And this new record mm-hmm. you guys are working on, you're recording the drums from your home. Is that correct? That's very much. I was, supposed, I was supposed to go to Blackbird uh, pre-COVID, uh, and I was supposed to do it in April. COVID happened. You know, the record was, the demos were very largely done, and they wanted to build on the drums. So um, with the advent of Audio Movers Listen To, 
which I had recently got gotten hit to in around May, uh, my engineer came over and installed it. And so he can drive my rig from his house or any engineer anywhere in the world, like a screen share can run my studio. Cause I don't know how to run that stuff. Like, wow. Could offer me a million dollars to record you a single snare drum hit right now. Okay. I couldn't do it. Um, so we did the whole record on a zoom call with Will Ivankovich, a producer and, and, and Tommy and J.R. Taylor, my engineer, and through Audio Movers Listen To, they're listening in their studios with an invite link in full high-resolution audio. Okay. So if I'm playing and, you know, Will or Tommy goes, hey, could you play a different fill going into the second chorus? Like, sure, JR, punch me in. Boom. And we did 17 tracks in three days. Nice. Uh, I did the, the whole record. I mean, I have no idea when this is going to be out. Um, you know, hopefully sometime next year. Yeah. But... Um, I'm really proud of this record and, and, and what we did. Uh, I think the songs are really great. Uh, def definite progressive leanings on this one. And um, I'm excited for people to safely hear it. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious that, you know, with the 20, nearly 25 years in the band, you have been given all sorts of creative licenses to kind of bring your essence to the material. And of course, all the new stuff that you guys are recording. I mean, when I listen to this stuff, it really does sound like you. What was it like 25 years ago when you're, when you are coming in and you're probably around 26 years old and you're replacing this original member of the band, John Pinozo? The thing that was the thing that I, I, I watched for the most and was tried to be uh, aware of was that I was replacing someone who'd been their drummer for the whole time, and it was the bass player's twin brother. Yeah. So that was sort of a heavy thing socially uh, because there was this personality that wasn't there. I never met John, but everyone that did always unanimously said he was the, the funniest guy and a, a jokester and a prankster. So <laughs> there's this big personality that's no longer there. And I was a 26 year old kid. I wasn't intimidated musically because I had all the records growing up. I saw them. I was in bands that played the songs and I was prepared when it came time to like the, for the first week of rehearsals of which I think there was about a month for the tour, uh, I, w I was ready to go. But it was that social thing of knowing when to talk, knowing when to shut up. Should I say this? Can I say this? Can't, this joke is a little risque or dark, like, I, you know, feeling it the room, right? Yeah. It was all those things that I uh, were the landmines that I, I, whether they were fabricated or there, I, I tried to be careful of. Mm -hmm. When did you feel comfortable uh, kind of opening up and being more yourself? How long did it take? You know, there was a moment that I kind of keep coming back to that I think was the moment that I had a seat at the proverbial table. Um, the tour started in May of 1996, and in July, we were in New York. That's when I got woke up and got the phone call that John Panazzo had passed away last night and we're all meeting in Chuck's room. Uh, we were in New York. I think we had two or three shows and some TV shows. And I can't remember what got canceled and when the funeral happened. Cause that period's a bit of a blur, but, uh, you know, went in there and, you know, everyone was obviously very upset and stunned. Uh, and I made myself scarce. I went out that night with a buddy of mine that lived in, in New York and we went out kind of, restaurant and bar hopping and, and I got back to the hotel and as I walked into the hotel I'll never forget this I walk in and I hear JY's booming voice and some laughter from the bar which was to my right and the elevator banks were to my left and I stopped and I thought to myself do I show myself at the bar? Will I be welcome? Will, will, or will my presence be a reminder that their literal brother and, and, and bandmate is gone and they'll never see him again? Yeah. Or do I just kind of slink off to the elevators and, and kind of call it a night? And I it's stood there decision. and I, yeah. I thought about it and I said, I'm going in the bar. That was, that was the harder decision to make. It would have been easy just to split. So I, I walk into the bar, it kind of, you know, 
proverbial hat handle sheepishly, and I'm like, you know, hey guys, and immediately it was like, oh, Todd, Todd, and they pulled up a chair, you know, and they had like kind of two little bar, you know, tables pushed together, and they sat down, and I listened to them uh, laugh and cry and tell stories about John, and, you know, had a few rounds of drinks, and, and I think that that's when I kind of felt like, and it's not just because John had died, mm-hmm. but I kind of felt like, okay, this is, that was a very warm reception I just got, and it, and it could have been a look, you know? Um, so that, that was kind of the moment that I think that solidified. And, you know, come to think of it, they never really told me I had the job. I've just sort of been hanging around for close to 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're good by now. I think so. you're golden. <laughs> yeah. I did that one time. I, actually, it was at your... Um, well, your your wedding shower at Jason's house that time. You remember oh, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. About Ten years ago. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I just really started to get knowing you, and I started getting to know the band a little bit. And you know, Jason and I would talk, you know, whenever we could. But you guys were meeting at his little cabana type thing that he had at the time. Yeah. And I just boldly walked right up to you guys. I'm like, "What's up?" <laughs> <laughs> and you all just kind of looked at me like, well, "That sounds just- like you, Jim." No, it's great. <laughs> I mean, I wanted you there. I wanted you there. Well, I know you did, but I, I just, you know, <laughs> that's just how I'm built. I walk up and I'm like, hey, what's going on? You know. Now, so, Todd, if, it, if there's this, there's obviously, this is a different world that we're living in. How would a kid that is graduating high school that wants to go after a career in the music business, how do they do it, man? What, they what, don't. What's the advice? What have we learned? Run. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> No, I think if they want to do it, they're going to do have it. Have something to fall back on, like being an electrician. Yeah, but there's a lot of people that say don't have the backup plan because that That's holds you good. back from the plan A. Well, yeah, I, okay, to, to back that up, there's no one I know that went and had a backup plan that didn't end up using it. You know, okay. everyone that just went for it, it's, you, you, you sink or swim. But what's a kid to do now? I don't know what the answer is, but I can suggest that, you know, we all take this time and that that kid should take the time to get as proficient and as versatile on the instrument as he or she can. Mm -hmm. That's all we can really do um, because our whole thing is predicated on being social, being in a room with a lot of people, whether it's a crew, a band, an audience, uh, whatever, there has to be a lot of people in, in close, tight quarters. And that simply is, is unable to happen now. And it's really unable to happen until there's, there's a working vaccine, which is a whole other thing that yeah. we don't need to go down. But th- and that's what I think it's going to take, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. But uh, that's what they should do is – because everyone's working. I'm trying to be a better drummer. I'm trying to spend a lot of time out there so that I'm, I'm better when the storm is over. No storm lasts forever. This might last a lot longer than any of us would like, but nothing lasts forever. So whenever that time is, I don't want to be the same guy I was in, in early 2020. I want to have some different ideas, some different things, some different skills. And, I, and I, I think ultimately, if we're able to spend this time working on ourselves, maybe reading some books we always wanted to read but never found the time to do it or whatever. Anything that we could do to make us better or learn a new skill or and be proud of the way that we spent this time. Sure. I really think that's that's the, the, the focus that we should be thinking about because then this was this wasn't time wasted. You know, hopefully we'll never have this kind of time again. Uh, so it, again, if, if we could be proud of how we conducted ourselves and that we, 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 we learned some skills, that's really the best thing that we could do. So I, I would suggest that same thing for anyone, including a music student who just graduated and is walking into this world that is, is, is put to a screeching halt. I mean, it's yeah. got, it's got to be terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, man. I've been working on some things, man. I, I, I took a little bit of time off from the drums. I feel like, you know, after, you know, doing this for 44 years, um, you know, you, there's, a, there's, a, there's some muscle memory in there, you know, and, and I'm a song drummer, so I miss playing songs with people. Um, 
but uh, I think that's, I mean, I think that's great advice. I mean, it's going to come back. And so the kids just have to be prepared, but yeah, that's the thing. The backup plan or no backup plan. The backup plan for me was my, was my degree in music education. I figured I can go teach. Um, never had to do it. I prefer this. I prefer recording and traveling the world. <laughs> I think in these types, you have a lot of opportunity. You just got to keep your eyes open for them. You know, sure. As, as paradigms shift and change like we're experiencing, yeah. this has happened before. We've been here before. Yeah. There's nothing new under the sun. Jim, it's your favorite time for the show. It's the right. random question of the day. Where Jim is going question? to ask you a completely random question. Todd, are you up for it? Sure. I'm All up right. for a whole a slew of random questions. <laughs> I'm going to hit the jingle here. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. All right. Hopefully that came through. It sure did. Thank you, Jeremy Little, <laughs> who composed that for us. Okay. <clears throat> I have a random question generator. I'm going, I've clicked a random question. I like it. I'm going to go with it. Todd, where and when was the most amazing sunset you have ever seen? Wow. Uh, I would have to say um, Bora Bora. Mm. Nice. Well, how, what, what, what was so memorable about it? Uh, there was a purpleness to the sky and the way Mount Utumanu silhouetted it with, you could still see some turquoise in the water. So it, it, as opposed to sort of a, a Malibu or Hawaiian uh, orangey, uh, uh, yellowy, this was like purples and blues that were wow. just sparkling. I don't even know where Bora Bora I, is, man. As in in a, South Pacific? Uh, yes, it's a, in a fr French Polynesia. Ah. Uh, there's there. a... You there's guys get to, Tahiti. Ah. You guys, Austin is similar to Tennessee where you get some amazing sunsets out there. Um, when I went out there, and I know in the beginning of the show, I talked about the Wizard Academy, which is right in Austin. Um, go check it out. There's a, they have a free wedding chapel called Chapel Dulcinea. And people can actually get married. It, it overlooks uh, the... the um, I guess the lowlands of Austin, but right on the cliff as part of the campus, they've got the most amazing sunsets. It was yeah. how, how are how are wizards involved in this? They call it because uh, it's an advertising agency, and the guy who started it uh, had a trilogy of books called The Wizard of Ads, and uh, it, it's it is a school that will really make you think. I mean, it's it's some cerebral type of stuff they go over. Wizardacademy.org. Are you, are you okay. saying I'm not cerebral? <laughs> I, th I think you are cerebral. I think you would resonate <laughs> Very there. Very cerebral. Oh, Extremely. Incredible. Love it. <laughs> well, this is just a great conversation, man. I, I know that everybody listening to this or watching this is going to just put in mind some serious wisdom nuggets, and we really appreciate your time, man. It was great to see you. I want to encourage everybody to pick up Last Flight Home. Such a cool idea. Be on the lookout for the new Sticks record, and uh, everybody can follow you at toddsukerman.com and then on the socials is it just your name i don't know but you'll but, you, <laughs> but people can find you I, I, would, I would imagine so i, yeah. I have I, I have two facebook pages uh and uh instagram really and a youtube channel that some instagram i believe you are todd sukerman let me see here. i gotta watch yeah. the social dilemma on uh, netflix everybody's watching it it's a great documentary on Yes. Is, is, that, is that going to make us want to put bullets in our heads, though? That's the thing. That's, well, I'm telling well, you, that's a video series. Please do that. That would be awesome. <laughs> you could really do it. I think, I think you could totally just get some major traction on that. Hear me suck. Hear me suck. <laughs> <dot com. laughs> what we are we talking a lot during this episode? I, <laughs> I don't usually laugh. We got a comedian on next. I don't even think we're going to laugh this hard. Oh, sure. Uh, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Other than they're in the wrong business then. Ouch. Oh, my God. Well, Todd, thanks so much for your time, man. We really appreciate it. Thank Absolutely. you, guys. Sorry for the, uh, the uh, interruptions here, but uh, all's well that ends well. Uh, good to talk to you guys. Remain safe and smart, and uh, um, we'll do it anytime you want. Or yeah, hopefully we can get together for some cocktails and cigars with Eric, man. That would be awesome when it becomes safe. To, to dodge the zombies and the zombie apocalypse. But uh, everybody out there, thank you guys so much for supporting the show. Any questions, concerns, praise, I got an email address for you, the Rich Redman Show at gmail.com. And as always, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Keep coming back for the good stuff. See you soon. Thanks, Todd. 
Cheers. This has been the Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com.